Every neighborhood has one, and everyone can recall the stories about the one in their neighborhood. Someone's friend heard it from a friend whose cousin's neighbor lived in it usually. And that's not exactly how it happened for me. I mean, sure, I heard the second and third hand stories, but not about the haunted house in our neighborhood. I grew up in the haunted house in our neighborhood. And at first, when we first moved there, I thought it was scary. I'd heard the stories about the house, and at ten, I thought I knew what to expect. When nothing like the horrible scenarios in my head played out in real life, I relaxed a bit. I had a normal, average childhood. Apparently, our house had one time in the past served as a mortuary. Of course, all the tools of the trade, all the chemicals, and all the rooms had been removed or redone so that no trace of the morbid past remained by the mid-80s when my family had moved in. The mortician and his family lived there completely unscathed by the supernatural. So go the stories, anyway. The place stood empty for 20 long years, and no one wanted to live in a mortuary, and they didn't want to buy it as a place of business, either. In the early 70s, a large family bought the place, took out the mortician's things, renovated the entire basement and mortuary area, and turned it into a fun, cool, hip place for the kids to play and have parties. After the renovations were complete and the family got settled in, that's when the bad shit started happening. The three of their five kids swore they saw people walking around with autopsy scars. At the time, the parents thought the kids were just being kids and scaring each other with these stories. And then, the mother was attacked by a man in an old black suit and a top hat. The clothes she described were from the late 1800s or early 1900s, I'm not sure which. And their priest came and did a house blessing. And he told them that there was indeed a dark entity in the house. A demon, he called it. And after the blessing, the priest left, satisfied with the job he'd done. And three days later, the father killed his wife, a daughter, and two sons. And then he cut his own throat with a bone saw, of all things. It was terrible. The mess was cleaned and then the house went up for sale yet again. And it sat there as empty as a jack-o'-lantern's eyes for another ten years before my family bought it. The kids of the neighborhood made sure that I got the low down on the place within the first week of living there. That's just how kids are, I guess. By the time I was in high school, that had changed. Not drastically, but it did change. Things started happening around the house. Small things, like my missing keys, would turn up right where I looked for them first. And the cat would hiss at nothing any of us could see, and then bolt from the room and remain hidden for the rest of the day or night. Now, I was a logical person. Even as a child, I would search for logical reasonings for the happenings. And I can honestly say that I was more logical and analytical than my parents my older brother, on the other hand, well, he was an even mix. He wasn't nearly as logical as I was, and wasn't nearly as ready to jump to conclusions about the supernatural as my parents were. He had a healthy curiosity about everything in life. In two years my senior, I looked up to him. I wanted to be like him, you know, cool and savvy with the ladies. I'd drive a cool old Chevrolet and let my hair grow out long. By the time he was a senior in high school and I was a sophomore, it was painfully obvious that I would never be like my older brother. Raymond was a cool character, and I was a nerd with thick glasses and allergies year-round. To say the least, I spent a lot of time at the house by myself after school. One day... I was home alone and studying for a major test the next day. Raymond had filched some of Mom's emergency cash from the cookie jar, and swore me to secrecy with the threat of death, and he left for the evening. 
Raymond had developed a fair amount of curiosity in the occult, and I'd seen him carrying around old books about magic. That didn't worry me much. How many teenagers don't eventually read up on magic? I've never known one that didn't. And it was when I found a book on demonology hidden between his mattress and box springs that I began to worry. This wasn't a book you could just go down and pick up at the local bookstore, no. No, no, no. It definitely had not been mass-produced, had no ISBN or barcode of any kind. The artwork was terrible, it was graphic and bloody, and hand-drawn in red ink. Raymond had changed after I found that book a few months back. It was dangerous. What would have been idle threats before were not so idle anymore. He'd whack me upside the head a few times, bloodied my lip another time. No, I wouldn't rat him out about the money, but I did hope he got busted for breaking curfew. That served him right. So after he left, I continued studying for my test. History. Now, I suck at history. And it has never been a good subject for me. Determined to be my best geeky little nerd that I could be, hey, we can't choose what we're good at, I was determined to pass the history test. I turned on some classical music. It was a Beethoven record that no one knew I listened to back then, and set to on some serious note-taking. Five handwritten pages later, I needed a break. And someone had to start the record over. Leaving my notes in my textbook on my desk open to where I had stopped and walked to the living room downstairs. The front door was still locked. Parents were working evening shifts all week and wouldn't be home until after the 11 o'clock news. This was not a new occurrence. I was used to it. I put the needle at the beginning of the record again and then walked back to my room, glancing into the kitchen as I took the corner to the stairs. Raymond stood just inside the back door. I had already taken the first riser when my brain screamed at me to stop and go check on him. He looked pale, sick. Something was wrong with him. And, well... I hadn't heard the familiar rumble of the Chevy as he returned home. Raymond was nowhere in the kitchen or outside the door. Shook, I poured a glass of orange juice and paced in time to the blaring music for several moments before heading back to my studies. Better to immerse myself in schoolwork than to dwell on what I had thought I had seen. When I'd gotten back to my room... My books were on the floor, halfway across the room. I froze in fear, staring into my room. I hadn't heard the books thump to the floor. No one was in the house with me, but suddenly, I knew someone was hiding in a shadow somewhere just waiting for their chance to spring out and murder me. A sickly sweat popped out on the back of my neck and palms, and the room seemed to dim as I watched. My studies were forgotten rather speedily. I flew out of the front door, pausing only long enough to ensure that it was locked, and then I headed to the end of the block, turned right, and walked down to the end of it. My aunt lived in the house there, and I visited her until my parents were off work. I never told them what happened that day, and looking back, maybe I should have. Maybe I should have told someone about it, but maybe I should have told my parents about that terrible book I found in Raymond's room months earlier, too. But I didn't. I have to live with that every day now. The thought that I might be responsible for Raymond's mental break is something I can't get my mind around. I mean, if only I'd told someone what he was researching, maybe we could have done something to stop him. That kind of guilt is a terrible burden to bear. 
After reluctantly following, or should I say cowering, behind my mother as she went into the house, I peeped over her shoulder, looked around stealthily for any sign of an intruder, and the whole time I shook like a leaf on a tree in a high wind. In my room, my books still lay on the floor, but nothing else seemed to be touched in the whole house. Since my parents were home, I put the incident out of mind, or... Well, I tried to. There was no logical answer for why my books were in the floor. Seeing Raymond? Well, that could have been brought on by the stress of all the intense studying I'd done after he threatened to kill me and left the house. The only possibility for the books? Well, I don't know. Maybe the cat had been on the desk and took one of her fits where she bolts away and she kicked the books to the floor in her escape from whatever the hell scared her. My mind latched on to these explanations, but my heart knew better. My heart was uneasy and kept me from falling asleep that night. I sat on my bed back against the wall, facing the doorway, petting the cat as she snoozed. It was well past midnight when I heard the familiar rumble growl of the Chevy as Raymond tried to drive her gently into the driveway to avoid waking mom and dad. Three minutes later, car parked and turned off, I heard Raymond come into the kitchen door, right where I thought I'd seen him earlier. His footfalls on the steps sounded lopsided as if maybe he were drunk or even sick. I stared at my doorway, still hoping he'd get busted for breaking curfew, and now possibly for being drunk on top of that. He stopped in my doorway, and to my horror, he looked exactly as I'd seen him in the kitchen doorway earlier, pale, drawn, sickly, and scary. Slowly, he turned to me and grinned, and that grin made my stomach turn over. It was vile. It was evil. I swallowed hard but didn't dare blink. Raymond raised a finger to his lips in a shushing gesture, turned away, and continued to his room. I didn't move or breathe until I heard his door close and knew he was in his room, safely away from me. Jumping off the bed, I ran to my own door and shut it turning the lock and then bolted back to the perceived safety of my bed. And, well, did I sleep that night? You better believe I did not. Not for a minute. The feeling Raymond carried into the house with him haunted me, and I was truly fearful all night. The next morning, as soon as he was gone, I went downstairs and started complaining to Mom that I was too sick to go to school. I played the part well enough for her to let me stay home. And it was Dad's day to pull a double shift at work, so he was gone by nine. Mom had errands to run and left shortly after him, promising to bring me something good to eat from our favorite restaurant in town. Bucking up my brave, I stood outside Raymond's room. I had to know what was going on with him. And after five minutes of my own mental pep talk, I finally went into his room. The room was cold. The curtains were pulled open, but it was still very dim in there. And the scary book was still under his mattress. Something else was there too. A piece of stained white fabric was wrapped around something that lay toward the middle of the bed. I pulled it gently out. I let the mattress back into place and placed the fabric package on top of the bed. The nausea swept through me and I faltered before unwrapping it. Inside it was what looked to be a Halloween decoration. A withered hand uh, severed at the wrist. Hell, it even felt like a Halloween decoration when I picked it up to examine it. I put it back where I'd found it it wasn't something I considered a healthy person would harbor under their mattress, but I wasn't overly worried. The book was far scarier. In Raymond's closet, 
I searched through his clothes. Nothing hidden in the clothes was a good sign. But then I saw dark marks on the southern wall near the corner. And upon further inspection, I saw that the dark marks were actually deep gouges. Tracing them through their origin, I was shocked to see that Raymond had dug a hole into the wall. The sheetrock had been removed in a rectangle shape, a bit smaller than the old steamer trunk that blocked the hole. And my heart raced. Even though the room was very cold, I was sweating. I needed a flashlight to see into the hole, and I got my father's biggest, brightest flashlight and went back to it. I was shocked to see that behind the sheetrock, there was a walkway wide enough for me to move through. Standing in there, I was between the walls. The old wall of brick to my left, and the newer wood and sheetrock wall to my right. At the end of the wall, which would have been the end of the hallway inside the house, there was a ladder that led down to an impossible depth. The flashlight barely penetrated the darkness down there. With one last look at the light in the entrance hole, I turned and descended the ladder. Not only was it scary as hell, but let me tell you, it was actually kind of intriguing. The ladder took me down far enough that I knew I was deeper than the basement where we sometimes had family movie nights. The cold stung my skin and the smell of old, stale dirt mixed with something else turned my stomach. Shining the light around, the enormous room with the dirt floor opened up before me. At first, it was hard to make out in the beam of light, but then my eyes adjusted, and I saw that there were several antique autopsy tables situated in a row down the middle of this room. My heart beat so loudly that I could hear nothing else as I walked to the nearest table. It, like most of the others, was covered in a thick, undisturbed layer of dust and cobwebs. I stopped at the middle table and swung the light right and then left. They all looked identical, except the one all the way over on the right side wall. A stained sheet shrouded something there that looked much like a human body. Now, hell, my first reaction was to run. I made it to the ladder and then stopped. If there was a body there, it had to be a hundred years old at least. I might actually be considered one of the cool kids at school with such a story to tell. Common sense dictated that if the body had been there all that time, it was harmless. So, digging deep for bravery that I didn't know I possessed, I stood over that shrouded form holding the corner of the sheet in one hand and the flashlight in the other. I couldn't yank the sheet away. I was far too scared. Instead, I lifted the corner a fraction of an inch at a time until the arm was revealed. The hand was missing. It had been sawed off at the wrist. I immediately dropped the sheet and ran to the ladder. I didn't slow down when I dropped the flashlight. I just kept climbing. I reached the top and stepped into that weird between-the-walls hallway and stopped dead in my tracks. My brother was blocking the exit. He stood there, staring at me angrily. There was a body laying on the floor just behind him, and I had nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. In a panic, I kicked at the wooden sheetrock breaking through into the hallway, and I ran out of the house past Ray's idling Chevy, and across the street to a neighbor's house. I called the police first, and then my mother's cell phone. The police took Raymond away that day. He was locked up in the psych ward of the hospital for a while, and then he was put in the state asylum for the criminally insane. My parents and I moved from that house immediately after. 
At least uncover the house's true history during the year after my incident. The first mortician had been secretly obsessed with reanimation of corpses. He had kept detailed notes of his failed experiments. And after years of failures, he turned his attention to ghosts of the recently deceased and had found a way to communicate with them. You had to kill the person to remove a body part. If you kept that body part with you, the ghost would communicate with you. And the mortician reported that one such ghost had given him the secrets of the afterlife and the key to immortality. This was the nonsense that had consumed Raymond's mind. And the last time I visited him in the asylum, I asked him about it. He was normally lucid, sensible, chatty, and it was hard for me to believe that he was crazy. This day he changed, though. His skin paled, his eyes became dark, and that terrifying grin split his face. When he spoke, I didn't recognize the voice. I am immortal now. It's all in my notes. I never have to die and pass from this world so long there is a viable, living, willing human to jump into. It's all in my notes. And then, all of a sudden, my brother was back to normal again. Like he was the Raymond that I knew. 